Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, my name is uh, M.V. Ramana, and I'm at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to join you. So uh, Maury sort of set up the problem uh, very well. You know, how are we going to deal with uh, the uh, phase down of uh, coal? Uh, as Janine put it, we want to do that by 2030. And I'm here to tell you that nuclear power can't help. Uh, definitely not in this time frame and probably never. Um, so to start the discussion, I want to point out that um, I'll just give you some background information so we can understand where nuclear uh, has problems. Uh, so the best days of nuclear construction are over three decades ago. All of the plants that uh, Maury showed and, and uh, Janine sort of talked about are all built long ago. Uh, and if you look at globally, uh, there were two peaks in terms of new reactors that came on the grid. Uh, one peak in the 1970s, which is mostly nuclear reactors in the United States, and then another peak in the mid-1980s, which is mostly uh, in uh, Western Europe. Uh, and uh, if you think about reactors having come online at a certain point, that means that they have must have, the construction must have, must have started earlier, which means that the order for these constructions would have started even earlier. And if that peaks occurred in the 19, late 1970s and uh, mid 1980s, then the orders for nuclear plants peaked much earlier than that, right? So you should understand that not, there's not much demand for new nuclear plants. Since the mid 1980s, uh, what we have seen is that there are many years when there are more nuclear reactors that are shut down than actually uh, are coming on the, on the grid. Right? Uh, and as a result of these uh, trends, what you see is that the uh, share of electricity around the world that is contributed, uh, that nuclear power contributes to, has been declining consistently. Uh, the maximum it ever was, was in 1996, when it was 17.6%. This is global electricity uh, utility um, uh, generated, I mean, grid uh, connected gender, uh, electricity. And that has declined to about 10%. <laughs> as of 2020. Uh, and uh, in contrast, if you look at modern renewables, solar and wind and uh, biomass and uh, geothermal and so on, the share of that has now increased just over uh, nearly 12% as of last year. Um, and this is, as I repeat, this is sort of figures from uh, BP and they have a certain methodology that they use. Uh, I'm just uh, cons using that consistently. Others use different methodologies. You might get slightly different fractions. But the trend is very, very clear that the nuclear share is declining uh, and the renewable share is growing very fast. And again, I repeat, this is not of capacity, but actually of electricity is generated, uh, delivered to the grid. The trend, why is this trend? Uh, and the answer is very simple. Nuclear power is not economically competitive. Reactors cost too much to build. Uh, and this is the reason why there is declining uh, orders for nuclear plants and even existing nuclear plants in many cases this in um, electricity markets which are competitive, they are shutting them down simply because the operating costs are too high. And uh, in, in parallel, uh, other sources of electricity are cheaper and becoming cheaper. Um, you all know how fast uh, the cost of uh, wind and uh, solar have been declining. But here are some figures from uh, this Wall Street company called Lazar. Uh, and that shows that the uh, cost of energy uh, in dollars per megawatt hour for solar um, uh, photovoltaics has declined from $359 per megawatt hour uh, around 2009 to $37 per megawatt hour, so over 90%. Uh, uh, in uh, 2020, so about uh, over a period of little over a decade. Wind in the same period has declined from about $135 per megawatt hour to $41 per megawatt hour. And if you look at the most recent constructions of nuclear plants and the, their cost estimates, we see that nuclear is actually having the opposite trend. Its cost has been going up. Uh, it was estimated around $123 per megawatt hour. Uh, in 2009, and that has increased about $163 per megawatt hour. So this can explain to you why nuclear is a declining share and why there's so few orders. Uh, this is not for want of trying. Um, you know, there's always, a, uh, people often, often say, you know, nuclear ought to be on the table. Nuclear has always been on the table, has always received a lot of government support, especially from the federal government. 
And in the first decade of the century, we saw a lot of hype about what is called a nuclear renaissance. So it's supposed to be this new wave of nuclear power plants that are built, uh, especially uh, uh, catalyzed by the 2005 Energy Policy Act under the Bush administration. And at that time, uh, there were about 30 reactors ordered uh, around the country. Uh, and uh, of that, about 15 gigawatts of new capacity was supposed to have come online uh, before 2021. In fact, what happened was almost all of those orders were canceled. Only four reactors began construction, two in South Carolina and two in Georgia. Uh, of these, the two reactors that were being built in South Carolina uh, were abandoned after about $9 billion uh, plus some financing costs, which is not clear exactly how much it is. So it's certainly more than $9 billion were uh, spent. But uh, that reactor project, essentially all that left is a big hole in the ground. Um, and uh, what's left right now is the one uh, nuclear power plant with two AP-1000 reactors being constructed uh, at uh, Vogel in uh, Georgia. And the current estimates are that uh, they are expected to cost about $30 billion at least. And they're at least six years uh, delayed beyond what they were supposed to, when they were supposed to come online. And there are still questions about exactly when that's going to come online. So that uh, both those figures are likely to grow even further. So uh, I think the, the, the picture was very well put by uh, Peter Bradford, uh, a former member of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the president of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. He said the nuclear renaissance has not yet avoided a single molecule of carbon emissions. If the $40 billion spent on it so far had gone instead to the many less expensive and more reliable energy sources, the climate and the country would be far better off. And the, 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 the cost increases and the time increases, uh, time delays that I mentioned in the case of the uh, Vogel project in Georgia are by no means unusual. Uh, in fact, one study of about 170, 180 nuclear projects around the world found that 175 of them had exceeded their budgets uh, with an average cost over of 117% uh, and about $1.3 billion at least uh, in, in uh, cost overruns. And they all took on average about 64% more time than projected. So this is a very general trend. And we should assume that this is going to happen as we go further too. Okay, now I'll turn to a little bit to small modular reactors and ask the question, will small modular reactors solve the problems of nuclear power? And for that, I should say that apart from economics, Nuclear power also faces three other major challenges. Um, one is the risk of uh, catastrophic accidents as happened in Chernobyl and Fukushima. Second is the production of radioactive waste for which we still don't have a demonstrated solution. And the third is the linkage with nuclear weapons proliferation. So if you think about nuclear power as a solution to climate change, not just to energy needs in Oregon or elsewhere, then nuclear power has to expand around the world in many, many countries, many of which don't have any nuclear power. And that automatically gives them a little bit of extra capability to make nuclear weapons. And when we've looked at all of these challenges and tried to consider what are the technical design elements that will help these challenges? And you find that not a single SMR design can solve all of these, okay? I'm not gonna go into all of them in any case, but I'll just say one important thing for this particular discussion, which is that if you go to the smaller reactor, all else being equal, you would expect that a smaller reactor would cost more per kilowatt of uh, generation capacity and, and per megawatt hour of, generation, of electricity generation than a large reactor simply because of what are called economies of scale. In other words, you require less um, uh, material per unit of electricity generation capacity, less number of workers, and so on, when you go to larger reactors. This is the reason why nuclear power plants started becoming bigger and bigger. Small reactors are going to lose that advantage. Okay? And also, per unit of electricity generated, they will generate more waste and have more proliferation risk for all else being equal. Uh, and if you look at uh, the actual small modular reactors being constructed around the world, we see exactly similar patterns. So Argentina started the construction of a reactor in 2014. Uh, it's nowhere near completion, though it was supposed to be completed in three years. 
Uh, in China, uh, a high temperature reactor construction started in 2012. It recently became critical, it's four years late and the costs are so high, they're not planning to build any more of exactly the same design. Russia started a, 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 a floating nuclear power plant, uh, which was supposed to, uh, construction started in 2007, which was supposed to start working in 2010. It was commissioned in 2020, 10 years late. And it's not been operating very well, partly because it's in a very remote part of the country, with, uh, uh, which actually tells you something about how one might think about nuclear power plants, which are used for doing load following or trying to fill in gaps in the uh, generation. Oops. Uh, and in, I would just say, you know, in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of these things, but just to say that other reactor designs are also delayed around the world. I'll now turn to new scale in particular. And I'll say new scale, when it was set up, was supposed to start operating by 2015, 2016. And the NRC uh, in, in 2008 put exactly that as its uh, proposed schedule. As of now, in 2020, uh, the NRC uh, undertook a, a, a study of the licensing of it, and the advisory committee of, uh, on radiate, uh, reactor safeguards identified a couple of very serious safety issues with the reactor. And so as of now, the new scale reactor, even though they may claim something to the contrary, is not ready for construction. Okay? Uh, and their current plans are that they will start constructing later this decade, in, uh, for the UAMPS project in, uh, uh, to be built in Idaho, but it's very, very unlikely they're actually going to meet that deadline. And if you look at the costs that are proposed uh, for new scale, you see exactly the same pattern. Its costs have been going up consistently. And if you look at the most recent cost estimate that was proposed, that was uh, mentioned by the uh, CEO of uh, UAMPS, uh, that cost is roughly the same per kilowatt as what the cost of the uh, AP-1000s being built in Vogel in, in Georgia when construction started. And the construction now has you know, doubled that cost. So you should assume that something of that order of magnitude is going to happen here, which makes new scale extremely unattractive. The last thing I want to say is that in as much as the problem that Maury mentioned that you know, there's going to be these gaps in the evening when maybe there's no solar uh, generation Nuclear, if you're going to try to use it to meet those gaps, you will reduce the uh, capacity factor, or even in general as a backup for wind and solar, you will reduce the capacity factor, which means the cost per level of, of, of energy is going to go up even further, making it even more uneconomical. So I will uh, stop there uh, and turn the floor over to Amory. Thank you very much. <laughs>